going to preach a topic today because I believe God wants me to preach it. I've preached it before, but I think God wants me to preach it again. And some of it might be as giving a sound to the world to hear on this topic, and then also having one mind and one mouth among us, right? Which is what we strive for as, as believers, to be on the same page. So that's my heart behind it. But to intro the topic, let me say this. It was about last night, about 9 o'clock, and I was still working on my sermon, you know, praying it through, asking God, is this what I preach? Do we go to this passage or not? And so it's still about 9 o'clock, still working on my sermon, and I get a message from somebody. They send me a message with a YouTube link. And this, this message came from somebody that I like, you know, who I respect, but they sent me a YouTube link about 9 o'clock, and this, this guy, he's a pastor, a pastor, right? Uh, but it was a link to a YouTube video about eight minutes long. I opened it up saying, well, it's Saturday night. We're both getting ready for our Sundays. This might be relevant. I opened up the YouTube link, and it's eight minutes about um, the need, the necessity to get out and stockpile food, water, guns, clothing. Hunker down, because this is the big one. It's finally here. It's coming. So I, I, I closed my Bible right at that time. I ran down to Albertsons. I bought a whole bunch of cheese Whiz and uh, saltine crackers, even though I can't eat saltine crackers. But no, I don't mean to belittle that. But that sincerely was the message last night on the heart of a pastor about 9 o'clock last night. And I was wondering if it was the end of the world tomorrow or the day after that or the day after that, what would God want me doing? And I prayed a little bit, knowing the answer, I believe. And I believe God was like, well, Logan, you need to finish your sermon up and get ready for people to eat from the Word of God tomorrow. And to me, it's like a small picture of this topic in general. What are you going to do tomorrow, right? Well, we're going to keep on preaching God's Word. Keep on preaching God's Word. In Sunday school, we read a passage in Hebrews. Would you please turn to Hebrews 13? I think uh, we'll look at this topic tonight. If you don't understand clearly what it is, you will in a second. But Hebrews 13, we read this in Sunday school, and then, so then it came back to my mind as I was uh, going through Sunday school this morning. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 says, 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Right in verse 5 is the idea that you don't need to stockpile a lot, because God's not going to leave you nor forsake you. And then verse 6 it says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If you look through YouTube and you listen to a lot of different people talking, there's a lot of things that man may do unto us. And I, I could actually be scared about every other day about what's going to happen to Christians, to Americans, to whatever it is. Something bad's going to happen to us. Everything from guillotines to gas chambers to prison times to FEMA camps to everything that mankind might do to me. Well, right there, the Bible says we don't need to fear what men will do unto us. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Because before it says, the Lord is my helper. And before that it says, God will never leave thee nor forsake thee. These are Bible promises that Christians have got to stand upon. Let me talk about this a little bit though. Because a week or so ago before that, what did I preach on? I said I preached on judgment is coming. So you're looking at a preacher, you're looking at a church that believes judgment's going to come. We're not crazy. We're not naive about that. Judgment, I believe you see it in Scripture. It's clearly going to come. I rebuke the post-millennialists who believe we're in the kingdom age, an age of revival and, right, the golden age of living. No, I believe we're in the dark time, right? The world's gone darker, colder, and judgment is right around the corner. We may see birth pangs, absolutely. We may see a famine, pestilence, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars. You get the idea. We may see all that. But I ask you, how should someone who believes that the end times are here, judgment is coming, how should we live? How should we live from a biblical worldview? I'm not going to try to give you my two cents. I'm going to try to look at the scriptures. The scriptures tell us how should we live knowing that judgment is around the corner for this ungodly, God-forsaken world. And the reason I think God has me preach this and had me preach it last year is because if you did not know, Idaho is really becoming one of the prepping capitals of the world. While other states are decreasing in population, Idaho's population is swelling, and a lot of these people are people who are worried about famine, pestilence, end times things. A lot of people call themselves Christians. 
So people are, preppers are piling into Idaho, and I've met many of them. I've met many of them. And 30 years ago, these people would have been people that would have come to our church. And faithfully, I almost guarantee it, with who they are, what they believe in Scripture. But now a lot of them are off the grid, out of town, stockpiling food, building bunkers. That's what they're doing. They're in the Church of the Wildwood. They, they really, I'm not joking. There are many, many families. I, I met a man the other day who seems to approach the Scriptures just like mine. Only difference is he's out uh, working toward living off the grid, out of town, and I'm not. I'm working on, working on building a church here in town. And I kind of ask myself, well, am I the fool in this whole thing? Because if we're supposed to be prepping, then he's right. If we're supposed to be working in church and sharing the gospel, then I'm right. And we both can't be right. So this is why we bring it up tonight. And I also bring it up because many of us, you probably ran into someone similar in your life. Here's this family, this couple that's learning about all these canning tech. And I don't, I don't begrudge anyone learning anything, but my point tonight is this idea, prepperism consumes. It's, it's not just a hobby. It consumes you. One, it's not enough to have the one. You've got to have the two, the three, the four, everything, if you're going to go for it. And you may sit and wonder, are we the, the, the idiots sitting here doing the wrong thing? Are we? Let's ask that question tonight. I hopefully you'll answer it. No, and I'll still see you next week. But I'll try to be fair about some verses that we look at. So my question tonight is, should Christians be preppers? Should, and I'm talking about the, just the common definition of preppers. Um, should Christians be preppers? And if you think about this, it's really a how you view your life kind of question. It really is how you view your life. Uh, if you will, go to 1 Corinthians 6. I hope you're ready to turn. We're going to turn a lot of places and quickly if we want to fit in a lot of content. 1 Corinthians 6. This question, should Christians be preppers? Let's start with viewing the life of a Christian. What is it? What's the purpose? Let's begin there. Look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. And remember what the purpose of life is. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Right? So that's a base level. We all can agree with this. We are supposed to glorify God with our behavior. Someone still may say, well, I can glorify God with being prepared. And, okay, maybe so, but let's just start here. We have to glorify God with our lives. Look over, it says the same thing over 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Yes, there can be differences among Christians, right? Some people do this, some people do this. Um, what brings us together is everything we're doing is for the glory of God. That's what brings us all together. So some of what I say tonight, if you are doing it in some way that you're actually, it's for the purpose to glorify God, right? That's why you do it. That's why you're going to keep doing it. That's what you prayed about, and God has you do it for His glory. And I won't argue with you much, but let's be honest about what we're doing and why. Look at 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That pastor I mentioned who sent me the message, I don't, I don't mean any ill toward him, but I'd love to sit down and look at these verses together if we ever had a chance. I would. I would. Um, to try to have iron sharpen iron. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I just said your purpose in life is to glorify God. And then what's your ministry? What's your job? What does God have you doing? I've preached it before and recently, but your job is, has to do with this ministry of reconciliation. Look at 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God gave you something. It wasn't your intuition. It wasn't your skills. It wasn't your strength. He doesn't need any of that. doesn't need your smarts, any of that. God gave you something. It's called the word of God. The word of reconciliation. That's what he gave you. That's what he wants you to deliver to the world as an ambassador. Look at 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as God, as though God to beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God. So what is your job? What is your ministry? Using the word of reconciliation, the Bible, our job is to be ambassadors, sharing the word of God. And I will argue with anybody that that does not change no matter the age you're living in. 
You can say we're whatever dispensation, it's always going to be about delivering this message of reconciliation to the world. Mark 16, 15, Jesus Christ gave us the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That never stops. You say, what about in tribulation times when it gets really bad? You know the proof that we're supposed to still keep preaching the gospel during, even during the tribulation? Is that God sends the two prophets to share the gospel, the word of reconciliation, right? That means before, right before the tribulation or whenever, right around there, we're still going to be doing that job. Last point, it's on the wall, so you don't turn there, but... Your purpose is to glorify God. Your job is to share the word of reconciliation. And what should you center your life around? I'll debate with anybody. A Christian's life should be centered around the local church. We preached some of that this morning. The ground and pillar of truth, that verse on the wall says, that's 1 Timothy 3, 15, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So whatever you do, it can't turn you into someone who's forsaking God's house, right? Agreed. This is, the central, this is a big point to me because a church's job should never take its mark off of churches. You know, from this church, you know what my goal is? It's, it's not to build a 10-foot wall around the church and for us to hunker down here until, until the cows come home. I want a safe facility and all that, but you know what I want? I want people from this church to go on and start other churches. I pray among all these 25 kids we have that someone goes out and starts a church or works in some other church. That's what I pray. Churches should be interested in churches starting, continuing for the next generations to come in new locations, wherever God needs a church. That's our focus, right? Part of this sharing the word of reconciliation. But now let me show you what's gone wrong, I believe. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. <clears throat> This is one of those topics where we all come at from different angles. We all have different life experiences. We've all seen different things. But the Word of God is true nonetheless, and it applies, it applies the same to every one of us. So that's what we're going to try to find. Colossians 2 and verse 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay, so there are a lot of people in our world today who don't even believe in God. They don't even believe the Bible's true or God's Word. They don't believe in sin being wrong. They don't believe in judgment coming at all. Okay? They have philosophies that will absolutely spoil you, so you shouldn't hang around them. Right? Those philosophies that judgment's never going to come will spoil you. But I want to tell you, the church's job is to not be spoiled by any philosophy. Right? Philosophy is not Scripture. Philosophy is not Bible. Trust you're still with him in Colossians 2 and verse 8. So, if some people have you focused on prepping for judgment, I want to tell you that you're getting spoiled as well. Some people say no judgment spoils your outlook on life. Some people say be prepping for judgment. I'm going to tell you it spoils your outlook on life. And I'll try to give you some examples of what I mean. But I just say this here, that the church, and in my circles, right, an independent fundamental Baptist, whatever that means now, I'm not sure, but in my circles growing up, we were very wary of this idea that outside influences, philosophies can spoil a Christian. I'm telling you somewhere we dropped the ball when it came to prepping. And now we listen to about any and every voice that wants to speak on the topic. We, we sit at their feet as if they are preachers, teachers, evangelists of the gospel. And they're not. They spoil us. They're all heathen. Amen. Look at, well, let me read it for you. Along the same lines. 1 Timothy 5.22. You know the verse that says, Lay hands on no man, or suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Christians, Baptists, independent Baptist fundamentalists have always known this. You don't jump in and start listening to somebody, reading from somebody, until you know that somebody is somebody you can trust, right? It's not a cultic idea. It's a protecting yourself from leaven idea. Protecting yourself from being spoiled. If you find you should look into people. But what do we do if this topic, if anybody talks about the end of the world, we say, there's my man. This guy's talking gospel talk. He's talking end of the world. He's talking end times. He must be right. Oh my goodness, there have been so many cult leaders and hypocrites in every denomination talking about the end of the world. They pick dates about the end of the world. They've been talking about it for, for decades. 
But we give, we give wiggle room, don't we? If they're talking about the end of the world, then trust them. Trust the Jew, right? The Shemitah guy. Trust the Mormon, Glenn Beck. Trust whoever else because they're talking about the end of the world. Friends, we are, uh, we live kind of hypocritically on this topic. I believe Christians do. When did prepperism become a theology, a <laughs> philosophy? That's when, it, when did it begin creeping into churches and Christian lives? Well, I can't speak dogmatically on this, but from my own experience, I think I can see some clues. In my own experience, and I love my upbringing, I, I love being raised around the Bible, but around the year 2000 was a thing called Y2K. And that was the first time that I had ever seen inside a church, our church, bring in people from the world to give us lectures about non-biblical things. It was. We, we had someone come into our little Baptist church and talk to us about Y2K and what was going to happen with Y2K. And it, it made an indelible mark on my mind of, whoa, okay, wait a second. These people aren't Christians. They're not talking about the Bible. But they're giving a lecture about something else. Not only left an indelible mark on my mind, I think it was the beginning of a, of a spoiling in many aspects of, of where I came from. Be that as may. Maybe you don't believe that, but from, from the Y2K, it went to everything else, right? You had the Shemitah guy with every whatever blood moon or whatever it is is going to pop up next is going to get you. And then the Mayan calendar thing. And pretty soon the church is focused on all these other speakers who have laid hands on suddenly, and they're not even Christians at all. They don't even pretend to be Christians, a lot of them. I think I saw in my own upbringing, I saw worldly, worldliness through vain philosophies sneak in through doomsday prepperism. And at the same time we were watching then the people of the world feed us all of their guesses and guesswork, which Y2K was a bunch of guesses, right? And the Mayan calendar in 2012 was a lot of guesses and Shemitah was a lot of guesses and philosophies. But while we were listening to all that junk, there were people at our feet who needed the very Word of God, the sure Word of God, so that their lives didn't unravel and whine and we lose kids from my youth group who go off into the world because we're talking about worldly things instead of biblical things. It happens. Why do I say it now? Because I'm trying to knock people in the past. No, I can't walk in their shoes and go through everything that we're going through. I can't, but I can make a difference right now and not be fooled by it right now. You realize that? No one knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. No one knows when Christ is going to come back. It, it could very well be, like the pastor told me, that this is it, this is the big one that's coming. It could be tomorrow. And then you can all say, wow, Logan really got that sermon wrong. But it also could be 20 years, 50 years from now. Which, by the way, 2000, uh, the year 2000 was 22 years ago. I knew people who, I, I, didn't, I didn't then, but I know them now, who in 2000 went and built that bunker and were living in that bunker when the clock turned to 2000. I, I read about them now. People are doing the same thing right now. What if they are wrong? And what if it's keeping them and their family out of church? It's a travesty. It's a travesty. I'll tell you, what, there's, a, there's every bit of biblical reason for us not to fall down in this rabbit hole. There's every bit of biblical wisdom on this topic. I'll show it to you. So, prepperism becomes a thing. I ask you, how has it taken off so widely? Well, I already alluded to it. How is, how is prepperism and now this idea of fear of the end times and all this worry and listening to unsaved people, how has it spread so widely? Well, we sit at the feet of the peddlers of the gospel of prepperism on YouTube and social media. I'm telling you, it's a real thing. Ambassadors of their gospel on YouTube have huge followings. Our little church following, we get a little follower here and there as we preach the gospel. It's not a popular thing. If I posted a video that said, the end of the world is 2023, September 15th, I would get some clicks, right? That's what people are into. It's not the gospel. But do you understand what I, what I say this for is that there are many, many ambassadors, thousands of ambassadors on YouTube. You know what they are doing? They are making money. Do you realize that it's monetized in YouTube? When you get so many clicks, so many likes, so all these doomsday preppers, even the guy that that guy that pastor sent me to watch, he's this young kid making a living talking about canning food and living by the river. Not the van down by the river, but maybe it was the van down by the river. I don't know. <laughs> he's making money. And so how do you continue to get that following, that click rate? You keep making up things to talk about. So everything is a false flag. Everything is a conspiracy. Everything is a sign of, of the government. Ready, here they are putting us in the FEMA camps. They make a mountain out of every single thing. They're just a different version of making merchandise out of you. Yeah. 
I'm telling you what, Baptists now, an independent Baptist would never waltz into a Catholic church and sit down. An independent Baptist hopefully would never walk into some of these lukewarm churches and sit down and listen, right? And support that ministry. What independent Baptists do when it comes to prepping. We sit down at the feet of these YouTube ministers, speak to us, Father, help us, know the way. This is the way. That's how it's taken off so widely. Yep. It has many great false prophets. <laughs> I don't even know to name names, but I'd name some already. And these people are making great living selling books, selling um, channels, right? Subscribers, um, selling merchandise, all the advertisers. Do you ever notice that you, if you watch some of those videos, they're selling all this survival gear at the same time? People are making a killing on this. Making a killing on this, and they have been for the past few decades, couple decades. Talking about conspiracies. The biggest conspiracy, or one of the biggest, I won't say the biggest. One of the biggest conspiracy I believe in. You want to talk to me about conspiracies. I want to tell you the conspiracy I believe in is that this phone is taking over our lives. That's a conspiracy I believe in. I, actually, I've, I've, I know some about the technology and the algorithms meant to consume your mind. To get you connected to this thing where you, you have withdrawals if you don't look at this thing. Where you got to scroll one more time. you got to watch one more video. That's a conspiracy I believe in. It's just they're using the power of technology to, to give you exactly what you want. And consume all your days. It really is. That's a conspiracy. You want to talk about living off the grid? I wouldn't do it because doomsday is tomorrow. I would, I would say the only reason I'd applaud living off the grid is if it gets you to throw the stupid phone away. Or at least stop watching YouTube videos all the time. I know it really hurt a man who I, I respect and who I very much trusted. It very much hurt him when he got himself one of these. And then on lunch breaks, he began watching YouTube videos instead of reading his little New Testament that he had done his whole life. I'd always seen the Bible in this man's hand. He switched it for this. Many Christians have done that today. Many Christians have. I'm going to my second page of notes, and this is a bunch of scripture. I've done a bunch of talking. Let me talk about some scripture now. So the question is, should Christians be preppers? I've already kind of shown my hand. I believe the answer is no. And why? Because here's what I believe. I believe prepperism is completely opposed to Christianity. Completely opposed to Christianity. Right? And we'll talk about different things. I don't begrudge anybody having some resources on hand if electricity go off like it did just the other day. That's not what I'm saying. But as a general rule, prepperism and Christianity are not compatible. You can't do both. Someone said, and I had a man tell me that on this topic. He said, well, can't we walk and chew gum at the same time? Right? Can't you serve in a church but also be prepping, be preparing? Well, I want to tell you that Christianity and prepping are more all-consuming than walking and chewing gum. The difference of, of, of Christianity and prepping at the same time is like walking door-to-door -door or hiding in a bunker. That's how different it is. It's a different approach, different mentality in life, different focus. Not possible at the same time. And how does this manifest itself in life? Well, I know people right now, people who I love, who I know they're inclined to, to prep. And prep all you want, your deal. But I've noticed something. I can tell when someone's been in the Word, and I can tell when someone's been on YouTube. And I'll bet you can tell the same with me. It's just worldliness. If I came to church every Sunday morning and, and my wife confessed y'all, well, Logan just watched YouTube videos all yesterday. That's why the sermon was no good. Y'all be, okay, yeah, I get it. I get it. It's, it's, it's not spiritual bread for our souls. Preparism versus Christianity. We're going to move through this. I have some verses to read. You can turn there if you want. I've got a few I will ask you to turn to. I have some principles, and I believe this to be true. Preppers live by fear. You'll always get the strong man prepper. I'm not afraid of nothing. Okay, and that, yeah, that's why you got 17 guns and 14,000 pounds of food down there, because you're just chill, right? <laughs> you're worried at least, okay? You live in anxiety, can I say? Preppers live by fear. Christians live by what? Faith. 
says that throughout the scriptures three separate times. Hebrews 10, 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's kind of what I'm talking about. People that I've known have been strong in the word of God, and then Y2K comes, Shemitah comes, the blood moon comes, this financial crisis comes. You realize I've been told the financial crisis, the economics was going to break down in 2012, 2016, 2020. Uh, Okay, we just can't keep waiting for that to happen and changing our lives because of what we think might happen. That's called being drawn back into the world. God has no pleasure in such people who take their eyes off of His Word and have no faith in what He's doing, what He can do for your life. Next point. Preppers focus on self-preservation. Christians are ready to lose everything. That's Bible. You will never find anyone in Scripture, and we'll talk about a few different passages, do apologetics a little bit, but a Christian mindset is never self-preservation, right? Queen Esther, if I perish, I perish. Well, if she was a good prepper, she'd have been hiding in the basement of that palace, never saying a word, because she's got to be smart. David, <laughs> right? Self-preservation. If David's worried about self-preservation, he never kills Goliath. Christians are not supposed to be worried about that. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the disciples, Paul the Apostle. It's never been a thing to focus on self-preservation. It says, Jesus tells us plainly in Mark 8, 35, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. That's what preppers are doing. They're losing their solid lives of service for the Lord. Hiding in some hills of Idaho today, probably, and around the world. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. You want to preserve your life? Go lose it for the Lord. Go live for the Lord. Amen. Throw it all out there. Put yourself, walk on, walk on, you know, on the edge of life. Amen. And God will uphold you. In fact, you'll find out on the edge is where your real life is. Please turn to Proverbs 22. I want to do a little bit of apologetics. Honestly, I haven't found a lot of good arguments, biblical arguments, for prepping. But I'll hit a couple that I've heard, and I don't mean to offend anybody who's ever used these verses. I've used them in different contexts. I really have. But to that point, if you go, if you search for the biblical rationale to prep, you won't find a whole lot of meaty scriptures involved. You'll find a lot more rhetoric philosophy. Proverbs 22, 3 is a verse that I've heard used for prepping and make prepping a, a priority in the church and in your home, in your life. Proverbs 22, 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. I believe, and I'll try to make the case, I believe to use that verse to defend prepperism is to take the Word of God out of context. I'm going to try to prove it to you. Well, one proof I see is the verse before. It says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. The rich and the poor are both going to die. That's where they meet together. They're both going to die. And the next verse says, The prudent man foreseeth the evil. The evil is that one day you're going to die, so prepare your soul to meet your Savior, meet your God. And hide himself with the simpler passed on and punished. I believe as I read the context, that's what it's talking about. Or as a second place, it may be talking about, look at verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward, which is related to what I just said. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that keepeth, he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. If anything, the evil is talking about not being ready for God or being ensnared by the evil that is sin. Right? The froward man is going to be ensnared by that sin. Not by the Shemitah monster. Amen. That's how you read it in context. But if you don't believe the context, you also are told in Scripture to compare Scripture with Scripture. So what does it say throughout the Bible? What I'm getting at here is that preppers say, hide yourself. Christians say, redeem the time because the days are evil. Amen. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Not hide yourself because the days are evil. Right? Different. It's a different approach. Matthew, let me read this for you. Matthew 25, 25, and 26 says, And I was afraid, and I went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Remember the parable of the talents? And the wicked and slothful servant was the one who hid out of fear. 
fear what was going to happen, fear about the repercussions. Hid. That's the same term used there. Hide because of the days. I don't see, think you see in Scripture a strong text that says Christians are supposed to go hide in a bunker or have a mindset of that in any way, shape, or form. Look over at chapter 21, verse 16, please. 21, 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. I believe, and I say it with some sadness, I believe I have seen prepperism draw a man out of Christian fellowship and instead place him among the fellowship of the, the doomsdayers, the Mormons, the survivalists, the hippies, and that's where they get their fellowship. That's who they listen to all the time. That's who they bump shoulders with, compare notes with. Instead of the fellowship among the living, God's people, they fellowship among the dead. It's sad. Yeah. Ought not to be, and I don't want it to be in this, in this church. I don't want it to be. Because you know what? We'll see more signs of the end times. We will. But every time we see a sign of the end times, some pestilence, some word of a famine, are we supposed to call up? I'm going to call up and say, no church on Sunday. Let's just all go buy beans. We can't get there. We can never drop the ball like that. Amen. Or I'm doing what happened in 2000 in my upbringing. Amen. Preppers say hide yourself. Christians say redeem the time. Preppers trust themselves. Christians trust God. What do I mean preppers trust themselves? Well, it's fine having skills, but all I ever hear preppers talk about are their skills. All I ever hear preppers talk about are their plans. Emergency plans. They've got it all planned out. And here, me, a fuddy-duddy Christian, I'm going to trust God. I don't have much for skills. And I haven't planned very far ahead at all. Am I just a doofus? Well, if I'm a doofus, I at least have God's Word on my side. And when I stand before God, that's what I'll tell Him. <laughs> Look at Psalm, please. Psalm 33. What's, what makes me sad about this topic is that I know true Christians know these things but they've been they've let the world spoil them and it hasn't been good for them their calling it hasn't been good for their family hasn't been good for churches we need soldiers on the on the front lines against the prince and power of the air satan himself instead we're hunkering down because of unknown evils unpredictable woes things we don't even know are true or not Look at Psalm 33, 18. That's what I want to read. Let me first say, say a line to you. Have you ever heard the phrase, God helps them that help themselves? It's a powerful verse, isn't it? Except it's not a verse. It's not a verse. In fact, it's quite counter what you see throughout Scripture. Especially counter grace and counter God's sovereignty. Look at Psalm 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. Well, I'm trying to do that. I fear God. I hope in His mercy. 19. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. I take that promise and I claim it as mine. Lord, can you keep me alive in famine? I'm going to try to live for you. Uh, some of these other friends I've had and other acquaintances I know, they're really preparing for the famine, Lord. And I'm just going to try to put myself out there and live for you, share the gospel, right? Give to a church, grow, try to grow the church spiritually. That's what I'm going to focus on, Lord. Am I going to be left high and dry? I'm going to take God's promise that I won't be. Deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Look at Psalm 37, please, as we're right over here. 37, verse 3. We're winding down. Only a few more points to go. Although an important one toward the end. 37. Um, 3 is what I want to read, but let me preface it with my little title here. Preppers trust their stockpiles. Christians trust God's provision. Look at Psalm 37. <laughs> Three, trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. You see, we're not the first ones on the face of the earth who've had to worry about feeding our kids, feeding ourselves. It's sort of been a thing through all of the earth's existence, through all of mankind's existence. It's always been a thing. And God gives this to people who trust in Him. Trust in the Lord and do good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You realize that there are people in the past in life who had to 
work every day for their food. They didn't have any, they didn't have any refrigerator with a week's worth of food. They didn't have any freeze-dried food that lasts on shelf life for years and years. They didn't have any of that. They're counting on their little garden to get them by and their friends and neighbors and what God provides. Right, people have already been there. Say, Logan, you're a fool if you're not gonna stockpile. Well, I'm gonna trust God like people have in the past. We'll see if God gets us by or not. I think he will, because he says he will. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Well, I'm going to try to delight myself in the Lord. My desire is that my kids don't starve. Says he'll, says he'll do it. Says he'll do it. What this allows us to do is it frees us up to live a life for the Lord, which many people have, for, have neglected because they've chosen to save themselves. What, you, I got a couple questions here. You may say, well, what if you're wrong and your kids starve? Well, then God's word isn't true. Who says God's word isn't true? Show of hands. What about Joseph? I've said this in the past. A lot of people have said about this in the past. What about Joseph? God told Joseph to prepare for a famine, right? He did. Joseph was, in that way, he was a prepper, was he not? Are you with me still? Are you still with me? Joseph was a prepper. But was he? Think about Joseph in his life. Joseph did not do a very good job of prepping for his brothers. He was terrible at that. He got thrown into the pit and sold. He didn't prepare for that, did he? Joseph didn't do a very good job of preparing for Potiphar's wife. That went all haywire. He got thrown into prison for that. No, Joseph didn't prep for any of those things. Instead, he lost his life, didn't he? As he did what was right, he spoke what God told him to speak. He lived how God told him to live, served what God told him to serve in Potiphar's house. But he lost his life. Joseph did. And then what do we know from Joseph? He found his life. He found it in the palace one day. Lost everything, landed in the palace. Christians, that can happen. Christians, that's God's given life for us. And then, now let's get this. Let's get to the part where he preps for the famine. And then, he's in the palace. A man who lost his life and then found it. And then God tells Joseph directly to prepare for a famine. Directly. I want to tell you, if we're going to use Joseph as a proof text, then you've got to wake up and tell me about your dream of the seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. <laughs> okay? But until you get the dream about the seven fat cows and seven skinny cows, I don't see it as a proof text for us all to be preparing for seven years of famine. Unless God tells you to. If there was another passage, if you turn to Revelation chapter 3, don't turn there, I'm joking. If we turn to Revelation chapter 3 and it said, Christians, begin to prepare for the famine. Begin to prepare. Ten years, get ten years supply. Then I would be right with the preppers. I'd say, it's biblical, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have my ten-year pile of food ready to go. Take some doing, take some focusing on that. But I do it. But there's no such verse. There's no such verse. Joseph, I'm sorry, is not a good proof text. I know many people use it. I've considered it in the past. Not a proof text. God used that to do what? To show the whole world His power and His glory, this whole sinful nation, just to simply point people to Him. Yeah, yeah modern-day prepping is not pointing people to the Savior. It makes us look and talk just like the world, sound just like the world, walk just like the world. And the world says, well, there's no difference between the prepper out in the bunker and those guys down there on 8th and 8th. There's really no difference. Well, there should be a difference. Please turn to, if you would, to Matthew 6. A couple meaty passages to go to and then we're done. Matthew chapter 6. If all these little verses I've read haven't meant much to you, I, I'm afraid that Matthew chapter 6, to me, seals the deal. Seals the deal for how we should live our lives. And seals the deal, in my mind, that preparism and Christianity are not compatible. You can only do one at a time. Look at Matthew 6, uh, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, Christ's words, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. That should be posted on every prepper packaging. Take no thought for your life. You meat, you eat, all right? Close. That's what Christ says. Says we don't need to dwell on these things. But what do we do in modern Christianity, prepperism? We dwell on these things. We take a lot of thought for our life. We take a lot of thought for our meat and what we'll eat and drink. Right? Water. How are we gonna get water? How are we gonna eat? It's all we dwell on. That alone, I think, kind of seals the argument. 
26. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are they not much better? Are ye not much better than they? It's a, it's a wonderful promise, isn't it? As I try to get the promises, God, how can you encourage me and make me not be worried about prepping like everybody else is? Can you encourage me? Sometimes I go right to that passage. Does God, He cares about the birds, but He cares about us so much more than the birds. His people, His followers, people that love Him, right? People that fear Him. That's who He cares about. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit into His stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. A lot of times when I think about prepping, I think about where do you start, right? I, I couldn't even contemplate how to be perfectly prepared for all the end-time calamities I know are going to happen, right? According to Scripture. I cannot prepare for them. It's always a question of when is God going to pull His church out, right? And how is God going to keep us afloat in the meantime? Because if we go through some of the things in Scripture, I can't plan for that. It says 29, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God knows how to clothe us. He knows how to feed us. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If I could preach a sermon to a, to a whole cabin full of preppers, <laughs> I would maybe lead off with that verse. I really want to tell, O ye of little faith. It's a faith thing. It's a faith thing. And Christians, we talk about faith our whole lives. But then we watch a YouTube video and we chuck faith out the window and we say, we got to do something about this. 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Guys, if the grid, you know, if the new kits, the EMP hits, and the whole grid is shut down, what are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? I don't begrudge some planning. I've already said that. But friends, right here, it's rebuked to have a focus on those kinds of things. It's rebuked. Next time the electric goes off, you're going to call me and be like, you ain't got no water, do you? No. I've got some extra water. I've got some extra food. But I don't make it a priority in my life such that I am disobeying God's word. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Yeah, the unsaved prepper movement. This is what they seek. The God-forsaking, church-forsaking prepper movement. This is what they're focusing on. Meanwhile, they're losing their families. They're losing their kids. They're losing their marriages. They're losing their callings. Look at the... Uh, oh, let me read another verse story. What about this verse? This verse, it looms large in my mind. And I've used it. And I still do. But what about 1 Timothy 5, 8? But if any provide not for his own, especially, and especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If you don't provide for your home, you're worse than an infidel. I've always taken this to mean as a father, as a breadwinner for my home, I need to feed my kids. If I'm not doing that, then and my kids and wife, then I'm not doing my job. I'm worse than just the heathen down on the street. Right? It's very true. That verse, I don't begrudge it. I don't deny it. I don't fight against it. You're an infidel if you don't take care of your family. But now I challenge you with verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You man, you father, leader of some home, or your life, you want to feed your family? You want to feed them the best ever? Seek God first. And all these things will be added unto you. You want to take care of your family, security, well-being, your own well-being, right? You want to do that? Seek God first. It's been said, and I totally agree with it, the safest place to be in your life is in the center of God's will. I firmly believe it. I was taught, I was taught by some of the same group that said that, but then got carried off with all kinds of wind and waves of doctrines that were not of the Bible, but of the world. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I, I know who wins. Christians win. Christians are upheld. If, if things go bad in life, I think we may see some modern-day miracles. We may see some shoes last 40 years. We may see food last longer, like the widow's um, food. You never know how God's going to supply and meet our needs. But I believe in that same God. Do you? 
I'm not about to take this God of miracles and a provision and say all of a sudden that his hand is shortened that he cannot save. <laughs> That leads me to this point. Two points to go. Preppers focus on the evil of tomorrow. Preppers focus on the evil of tomorrow. Christians focus, or they're supposed to focus, on the evil of today. And this, I'm, friends, this is one of my biggest points among the whole lot of them. Preppers get you thinking about down the road, down the road, this year, this date, this coming doom. Meanwhile, please look at verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There is enough evil right now in this present hour to consume your focus. There really is. In this building, I mean, evil is a strong word, but in this building, there is enough to consume our focus. We've got all kinds of souls in this room. Young children that need the Lord, adults that need to get serious about serving the Lord, people who we need to bring the gospel to and be praying for, and needs like we're meeting people who have all kinds of needs in their lives. There is enough right now to focus on. And that's how God wants us to live. If I took all this focus and all these wonderful children who need to believe the gospel and raise the things of the gospel, and I said, okay, there's that evil, but there's also this big old evil coming in 2023, have you heard? You lose focus on the present evil, the present things that need done for God's glory. This is what the prepper mindset misses. It really does. It really does. And homes fall apart to my sermon this morning. Homes fall apart. Young people go off into the world. I gave a bunch of examples this morning of how all those numbers of how homes fall apart, marriages fall apart. People are rejecting the gospel. People are dying and going to hell. That's a present evil, isn't it? That's a present evil. We're focused on the calamity of a food shortage, you know, however many months or years from now. And meanwhile, someone is going to give their last breath and they're going to fall out into eternity and burn forever and ever, have rest nor day nor night. And here, you and I, we're focused more on the calamity to come, worldly calamity, temporal calamity. The last point is in Luke 12. The last point is in Luke 12. You turn there with me. Again, like I said, I want, um, I want a sermon that goes out. Hopefully I can combat some of the <laughs> terrible YouTube videos that put Christians' mind um, in a state of anxiety and wandering and instability. I want to put it online to combat that. But also here among our group, I love to be on the same page. One mind and one mouth serving the Lord. And I know we all are, we're all responsible people who don't want to see our kids starve. I'm just telling you, God will provide. We can serve Him. Look at Luke 12, 16. Luke 12, 16. I, and I love the fact, well, what if you're wrong, Logan? Oh, boy, I will, I will trust God any day of the week. I'm just going to trust God. If this, what you're saying is, what if you're wrong, Logan? What you're saying is, what if this Bible's wrong, Logan? What you're kind of saying is, what if God's not real, Logan? Well, you're kind of, it's, it's really quite terrible. I'm going to trust this Bible. Look at Luke 12 and verse 16. My last point is this. You, you know the story. But preppers focus on temporal things. Christians focus on eternal things. Watch 16. And he spake a parable unto them, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. This man was the original stockpiler. This man was the original prepper. This guy had a bunker and then some, another bunker, built a bigger bunker. This guy was ready to go. Where was he? You know the story. Look at 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He's focused on those things. Christ said we don't need to focus on those things. 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? He dies. 
All the food stockpiled. What good did it do him? He died without the Savior. What good did it do his soul? He died and went to hell. It's a tragedy. This word of day, well, I, just, I will say this. I've got this written right here. I'll say it. I have already met in my life, I've met a man on more than one occasion who was absolutely focused on the 25-year shelf life of things. And he died, and I'm not lying, I've met at least two men who said this to me, and then I've seen what transpires. Within 25 months, they're dead. They tell me about all their, their stockpile for years and years and years, and within 25 men, months, both those men I talked to died. And I don't know if both of them are saved or neither of them saved, I'm not even sure. But friends, that's where our, 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 our the minds in our world are at. And Christians now, who for years know to fight against it, no, what if you die today? What happens if you die today? You stop thinking about your future and all these possessions you have. Stop thinking about that. Think about if you die today, do you have Christ as your Savior? That's where Christians have been for years, but now it's like, oh yeah, yeah, you've got a lot of stuff, I got a lot of stuff too. Let's compare notes. Can you, can you, can you fish like that? How can you fish? How do you can? Where are you going to hunt? Where are you going to live? How much should we have? Compare notes. Uh, friends, people are dying and going to hell, and my big complaint tonight is Christians are right there talking about canning goods instead of the gospel. May it never be said of us. May it never be said of us. We're ready to close. I will read one more verse. I'm sorry. I've read it before, but it's just so good. My final advice, not necessarily related to how we just closed. Keep that thought. But my final advice, and again, I hearken to the best reason to get off the grid, is to throw this thing away. Because, let me read you a verse. This is where Christians' minds should be. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Right there eliminates about 99.9% .9 of all YouTube videos, of all Facebook posts, of all social media, anything. Whatsoever things are true and honest. Whatsoever things are just, that's a whole nother level. Right? Whatsoever things are pure, that's a whole, whole, whole nother level. As you watch your YouTube videos and you're always seeing some nasty thing thrown in front of your eyes. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. Of good report means it's tested and true, right? You have just, true, you have just jumped into it. Oh, I really like what this person's saying. You know nothing about them. They're not of good report. You didn't talk to a pastor about it. You didn't talk to anybody about it. You just jumped into it. If there be any virtue, right? Moral virtue, right? If there be any praise, if what you're looking about and thinking about brings praise and glory to God, you've got a winner. If not, what good is it not bringing glory to God? Then it says, think on these things. I, friends, I want to tell you, I want to testify, or I want to confess that I need more Philippians 4, 8 in my life. Do you? Therein is where I'll end the sermon. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us. Lord, as a church, help us not be... Um, Lord, spoiled by any philosophy of this world, Lord. There's all kinds of wicked philosophies. And how are we to know the difference, Lord, if we keep our eyes on what your word says? Help us do just that. Help me, Lord, as a preacher here with all kinds of faults. But help me, Lord, to continue to bring forward just what the Bible says. Lord, I pray that you'd wake me up and give me a stiff and rude awakening, Lord, if I get off on philosophies that aren't of this book. If I get off on skeptical discourse or things that I just think might be true and conspiracy theories that have nothing to do with the Word of God, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd give me a rude awakening. And I confess that, Lord, honestly. Lord, I commit that to you as a covenant between myself and you. And, Lord, I pray that our church would have the same mindset, that we are Bible people. We're not people to wander away from it, Lord, because we know, like we said this morning, the Bible is a solid rock to build lives around while everything else around is sinking sand. I pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.